feel like I got a sermon right there, Theo. Thank you for that encouragement. I don't know, maybe some of you can remember that critical juncture in your life where you had to choose to use the reading glasses or not use the reading glasses. And, and, and I have a critical choice to make this morning, whether to preach, being able to see what I actually wrote, or, or to see your faces. <laughs> and I'm not sure exactly what to do, or maybe I just need to increase my font on my notes, one of the two. I might, I might be okay, because I, I, yeah. It's okay, they're from the Dollar Tree. It's, it, it's okay. That's just where I'm at. It's like bifocals or not, I don't know. Well, Aaron sends his love and prayers. He's currently probably about a half an hour away from San Jose on an airplane coming back from the Evangelical Covenant Church's annual meeting called Gather. Uh, he got to spend uh, almost a week in the beautiful Kansas City area, um, and it was, a, it was a good time, good time of connection and prayer and obviously just continuing to seek the Lord's direction in all things, even as a denomination. He did want to remind you that if you have uh, been participating in the discussion group on Sunday nights, he is going to be here, so hopefully you can make it tonight. And if you haven't uh, been able to to join in on that. Um, come join. It's, it's a really good discussion. I thought it timely then, since this is, uh, you know, the week of gather coming off of that, and as we're right in the middle of Genesis 1 through 11, we're at this pivot point, and I just thought it would be a good time just to remind us who we are as covenanters. Uh, there's a rich history in the covenant church. If you're new or if you're watching online, you're like, covenant what is it it's, it's a denomination the evangelical covenant church and we hold to six affirmations these are our core beliefs we anchor everything that we say and do in these six things and i'm just going to read through them really quickly the first one is the centrality of the word of god meaning that we center our lives around god's word we have the necessity of new birth this this truth that god wants to do a new work in us we have a commitment, we affirm a commitment to the whole mission of the church. We affirm the church as a fellowship of believers. We affirm a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, and we affirm the reality of freedom in Christ. Those are our six covenant affirmations. It's who we are as covenanters. So I want to focus a little bit this morning on the first one that we read, the covenant church states uh, its view of scriptures as follows. We said the centrality of the word of God, and they expound on it quite a bit more. And it says this, that the scriptures are the holy, the holy scripture, the Old and New Testament is the word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. And that in itself is a loaded statement. That the word of God is the only perfect rule for our faith, doctrine, and conduct. It's further explained and, uh, in, a, in several documents, but I wanted to just share a couple paragraphs in the conclusion of it. It says from the covenant, it is essential then to the life of the church that it be a company of people who desire their lives be shaped by the powerful and living word of God. The alternative is clear not to be shaped by the word of God is to be shaped by the world. On every side, attractive and persuasive voices urge us toward conformity to the spirit of this age. There is no escaping from these pervasive influences. Only the church that hears and responds to the word will be able to be a prophetic voice in the wilderness and bring healing to a confused and troubled world. So I share this with you because it's imperative as we look to the future that we are grounded in Scripture, that we are grounded in these foundational truths. It's one of the reasons that we decided to journey through Genesis together with you. See, what we learn about God in Genesis is the foundation for understanding Scripture. And as we've looked at these first chapters, 1 through 11 specifically, we are invited to reframe our understanding of reality on Scripture. See, what we think is most fundamentally true about God, we reshape uh, what we think about the world, how, about how God feels about creation, how God feels about us, and in order to do that, we have to actually open the book, right? People of the word. There's a story about a pastor who went to go visit a couple from his church. You may have heard this story before. The couple wanting to host a fancy dinner, of course, brought out their finest dishes and their finest silverware, literally 
silverware. The pastor arrived and they had a wonderful dinner together, great discussion, great connection, and they even prayed together. And after the pastor left, the couple started to clean up and they realized that one of the silver spoons was missing. They looked everywhere thinking perhaps it had fallen off the table or maybe fallen under one of their shelves. But alas, they could not find the silver spoon anywhere. And so rather than, you know, I don't know, I, I guess they just concluded that the pastor must have stolen the silver spoon. Rather than simply ask the pastor about it, they said nothing. And, but it grated on them every time that they saw the pastor preaching the word or singing, that's the pastor that stole my spoon. They said nothing until finally a year later, after the kind of some anger and even some seeds of frustration set in, finally, one of them confronted the pastor about the stolen spoon. We invited you into our home and you stole our spoon. And the pastor smiled and he replied, I'm so sorry that you haven't been able to find your spoon. I did not steal your spoon. I put it inside your Bible. But um right? Let's pray. Father God, we are a people of the word. Not one that's hidden on a shelf, not one that's gathering dust, but the word that is living and breathing that inspires our lives, that challenges us, that refines us. And so, God, this morning, help us to not be people that neglect your word. Help us to listen, to trust the story, because it reveals who you are, who we are, and the great love you have for this world and the mission that you have for us. Help us, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are reflecting again on Genesis 1 through 11. I do encourage you to bring your Bible every week, and it's okay. Bible apps work too. Technology, as we learned last week with the Tower of Babel, it's not bad. Uh, God can use it. God can use Bible apps as well. So I just encourage you to revisit this week. Find the time and read Genesis 1 through 11 again, because the book itself is going to pivot right here. If we're following along on this painting, we got through the Tower of Babel this week. We're, we're right here on the painting, and we still have so much more of the story left to unfold from this Jewish perspective that we're looking at and learning from. But if you remember even the Bible Project videos that we had, there was a chain link right there. There's a transition that happens naturally in chapters 1 through 11. So if you look at chapters 1 through 11, it is a part of this greater narrative. Think of Genesis 1 through 11 as the preface. See, if you're reading a book, uh, the preface is the part of the story that introduces you to this greater world. It gives you a sense of understanding. It's different from your world. We're being introduced to characters. We're being introduced to concepts. We're beginning to understand for us this ancient civilization, these ancient stories that God is using to reveal more of who he is. It's the, the preface for the rest of the story. Tomorrow we pick up in uh, Genesis, or tomorrow, <laughs> come back tomorrow, same time. Next week, next week, we'll pick up in uh, Genesis chapter 12, and we'll continue through chapter 50, and now we're in like the introduction. If you have the preface of a book, you now have the introduction of the book, and the introduction sets up characters and plot, and it really sets the stage, and there's a transition here where we begin to learn specifically about Abraham and his family and his people, and his relationship with God. So really quickly, I do want to challenge you to read 1 through 11, but we're going to review really fast, right? Genesis 1, the title of that was Trust the Story. We learned that creation is good. We learned that God knows when to stay enough, and we learned that at the center of the story is rest and an invitation into a Sabbath rest with God. Genesis 2 through 3 was a story of Adam and Eve. We called that one knowing when to say enough. If we are made in the image of God, then we also should know when to say enough. 
And so unfortunately, it is a tragedy that Adam and Eve didn't know when to say enough. See, we are different than the beasts that don't know when to say enough. We also learned that God's view of his creation has not changed. He does not look on us any less. In fact, he loves us. And we know that he has provided a way for us. God, in fact, invited them and sought them in the garden, saying, where are you? You're not where you're supposed to be. God still loved them. In Genesis 4, the sermon was called Master the Beast. And we begin to see Cain and Abel, the children of Adam and Eve. We see here that fear entered in that fear is the antithesis of trust, that God even came and talked to Cain, a conversation one-on-one, and and warned him, Cain, don't do this. What we learned was that humanity's position on themselves had changed, that we no longer see ourselves as good. Cain no longer saw himself as good. In fact, he was full of shame. See, God still thinks that Cain can be the person that he created him to be. God still believes that we can be the people that he created us to be. Chapter 5 was a genealogy, uh, which we're going to talk actually a little bit more about next week. Chapter 6 through 9, we're introduced to Noah. We're going to talk a little bit more about Noah today. And we talked about his bow in the clouds. And we learned that God wants to save creation by inviting us to partner with him. Right, that verse, who is God that he is mindful of us? That God actually says, no, I actually want to partner with you. He wanted to partner with Noah. And we're gonna find out next week, he wants to partner with Abraham. See, God still knows how to say enough. We need him more and more every day as we continue to learn that lesson of how to say enough. And in this case, God said, enough destruction. And again, the invitation in this story to come find rest with God. Genesis 9, the second half of that in verse 10, we put these two together, but there was a misplaced curse. See, some stuff happened with Noah. His son came in. And instead of cursing his son, he actually cursed his son's son. There's a whole bunch of conversation around that. But it is another story of tragedy again. Noah becomes obsessed with destruction this time, taking out vengeance on future generations. And then we stepped into the story about the Tower of Babel, a tale of a tower, where people uh, discovered some technology. God did not say that that technology, the brick, was a bad thing. But they become obsessed with making a name for themselves. And the people were scattered eastward. And Aaron described that uh, the, the concept of going eastward is symbolic of going farther and farther away from God. So God's going to continually invite them back to him. So they're invited to turn back to God and to be united with him as he intended. See, God scattered them, and he says the only way that you will ever be able to succeed, now that you all speak these different languages, this will be evidence of who you are as my people, is that you will become the people that I created you to be, that you will be able to set aside your differences, and that group of people will change the world. That was Genesis 1 through 11. We sit at this precipice. That is the preface. So if we step back and take this bird's eye view of Genesis 1 through 11, what do you think it is? Pop quiz. What's the word we've been working on? A chiasm. And so this was a breakdown um, from the podcast, and he actually had several graphs. I know you can't see it, but you can look and see Genesis 1, and break, basically it's the exact same breakdown that I just gave you. And uh, trust me, it's a chiasm, okay? So right in the middle there, we have, it's a different pattern though. It's A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, instead of A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. So it's a different pattern of a chiasm. But it points out that there's a center to this story of Genesis 1 through 11. And of course, we're asked what's at the center. At the center of the chiasm is this verse, Genesis 5, 28 through 29. And I'll admit, at first glance, you're like, "Eh, 
I don't see the significance. But as an Eastern reader, as a Hebrew, as a Jewish reader, they would find the significance in this. They would see it, and it's again a reminder. The verse is this. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground that has cursed. So in the midst of this greater story, in the midst of this pattern, we are introduced to Noah. We're reminded of Noah. Why is Noah significant? Well, in Hebrew, the word Noah, that's fun to say. You could try it when you go home. Noah means, what do you think it means? Rest. His name means rest. Rest is the foundational premise. It's the preface of the biblical text. And we're reminded over and over and over again. We sang it. We read it in Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. That's foundational to being God's people, Noah, he rests. And that is a comfort to a people that are toil, uh, toiling and laboring as slaves day after day to be reminded of who we are and that God's invitation is to rest in him, to rest with God. And the scriptures Invite us that place. If you're willing to find the place of rest and to not be obsessed with your fears, your own creations, your own relationships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you fill in the blank there. If you're willing to not be obsessed with blank and come and be with God and know when to say enough, God will use you to be a part of his bigger story of putting creation back together. Remember, he wants to partner with us to restore creation. The story is good. The book is good. God's word is good. We can trust it. The authors of Genesis knew exactly what they were writing, inspired by God. And these themes play out over and over and over again in the biblical text. So through scripture, we are being invited to reframe our understanding of reality. We are invited to reorient our life around God's word. So there is an invitation this morning. God's invitation is first to us as individuals to be with him. We are Hillmark Covenant Church. We affirm the Holy Scriptures, the Old and the New Testament, It's the word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. And Hillmark Covenant is made up of individuals. And I have to ask, is the silver spoon still lost in your Bible? When was the last time you really soaked up the word of God? Not to gain knowledge, not to give facts, not to be able to defend or, I don't know, debate. But just to be with God in his word. When was the last time you sat in silence, resting, listening, praying, letting the word ruminate in your heart, letting it burn a little, letting it sting, wrestling with it. 
letting it refine you, letting it sculpt you. Well, if it's been a while, it's okay. Get it out and just start somewhere. Psalm 46. Remember your first love. Remember that? When you first realized who God was, what Jesus had done for you. Oh, man. For most of us, if, especially if well, I was born in 1975, but I hear back it was like the thing of like, it was like, I'm on fire for Jesus. We had all these phrases, right? You remember that? If it's been a while, it's okay. It's been a while for me. It's been a tough season. But God didn't fail. I had to be very intentional to do the very thing that I'm talking to you about. Because I found myself very dry. And God's word invited me to be still and know that he was God. Come back to God. Remember the joy of your salvation. Remember, take the time to soak up the word. Don't wait till January 1st when the calendar flips and you come up with a New Year's resolution and I'm going to actually do it this year. Let this be the day. If you need that, July 1st is coming up. <laughs> July is your month. There is an individual invitation to each one of us to be God's child and to sit with him in his word. So the question is, when was the last time the word of God changed your life? I mean, really changed it. I mean, really, God's word dug in there and said, that doesn't belong. And you recognize it and you saw it and you confessed it or you lamented it and you said, that has to go from my life. God, I want to be different. And your word is inviting me to be transformed. And I choose you, God, instead of this thing that I keep holding on to. When was the last time the word changed your life? And if there's a testimony among you, write it down on your welcome card. Turn it in. Those are the stories that we need to hear as a body. The stories of God's word transforming your life, changing you from the inside out because we are a people of the book. And the book is a double-edged sword and it refines and seeds are planted, and beautiful things can grow out of our lives. It's a challenge. It's not going to be easy, but it's an invitation. God's invitation is also to us, the body, the church. Aaron and I were invited to walk with you almost a year ago now. It's gone really fast. August 15th. You've shown us grace. And as we've endured probably one of the hardest years of our lives, experiencing so many challenges, loss and grief. And, and like I said, even the inner work that God was doing, I can speak personally in my life. In some ways, I feel like I'm finally coming out of the, like the muck and the mire, you know, the clay. Thank you for journeying with me in that. We're invited here, though, as pastors, and the word that we keep getting um, told by our coach with the PSWC is till the soil, till the soil, till the soil. That's our job. It's not an easy job, just so you know. So I grew up on our little ranchette in Goldendale, Washington, a lot like here, and I spent many, many an hour sitting on a tractor with my dad, probably one of my most favorite memories. Hours just circling Circling the field, watching the discs till up the soil. I just didn't want him to be alone. And so I know how hard tilling the soil can be. 
especially if it's dry. It is work, and the hardness of the soil can determine the amount of work that it's actually going to take to prepare it for planting. And, and that is the season we are in, Hilmar, the season of tilling. And it's work. And it's hard. But the seeds that can be planted, the fruit that will come out of it, if we are willing to allow ourselves to be tilled, to allow ourselves to be tilled, there's a lot of fruit that can come out of it still. As I reflected on that last year, then I kind of went back to the different sermon series that we did. And we started uh, by focusing first on identity, that individual piece, like who you are in Christ and all the factors that go into that. But invited again to center your identity on Christ alone, not on anything else, not on who, who you are, where you come from, what you've done, what you're going to do, what people say you are, your body, your mind, all those things. Can you center your identity on Christ? That was a sermon that we preached in the fall. And then in January, we started journeying through Philippians, and that was the corporate journey that we were having, invited through the word, almost explicitly the word, because we literally read through Philippians verse by verse by verse. Like, if you got mad at us, sorry, we were just reading scripture. <laughs> and the scripture was invited to be united in Christ. And now we're reading through Genesis, and there's intentionality in that as well. Can we begin to see things from different perspectives? Can we learn from God's word anew, from a different perspective? And even that idea of seeing things from different perspectives applies to our relationships. Can you truly see and hear and listen another perspective as we continue to move forward together as the body of Christ? And so I am curious, if you reflect on this last year, has the word changed you corporately? Are we different? Honestly, we, we should be. Because God is in the business of renewal. God is in the business of transformation. Aaron and I, we're just the tools we're just the discs that God has here for now. We're just here to give you the word, and the spirit gets to do the work if you're willing. So has the word of God, has it changed our worship? Like, do we feel like we're worshiping more authentically or, I don't know, are we united in that? Are we singing louder than we've ever sung before? Has it changed the way that we gather, the way that we fellowship before or after the service? Or maybe what we're doing midweek. Are we gathering differently? Because God's word exhorts us to do that, especially in Philippians. Has it changed at all the way that you interact with the community? Because we are a missional people. Or are we just doing what we always do? Are you biding your time until these newbies, Aaron and Jackie, you know, they're, they're done, until our real pastors come so that we can just keep doing what we've always done? Because, church, I'm sorry to say that is not what you are called to in this next season. God's work is constantly full of stories of inviting his people into a new, fresh work of the Spirit. And there are also numbers of stories of people remaining in what they've always done, and they've missed where the Spirit is leading. Recently, someone asked, do you really think we're not united? Are we running yet? Are we running on the mission together? Because if we're not, then my answer is probably not yet. We're not quite there yet. Because I think we still 
are being invited to orient our personal lives and our ministry, our corporate identity around what matters most. And I started this by saying we are a people of the word. And I don't just mean that we put the Bible in the center of the room and we point at it and we say, that's important to me. But we are a people of the word that open it. And it transforms us from the inside out. Is that what we are known for in Hilmar? Man, be careful when you go to Hilmar Covenant because when you go in, you're not going to come out the same. I don't know what they got in the coffee over there, but man, God's going to do something in you if you go to Hilmar Covenant. There is joy flooding out of that place. There is love. There is hospitality. And man, they love this town. Is that who we are? Somebody also asked us, what is it that you want us to do? (laughs) I guess we're just asking you to be willing. Are you just open to what God is inviting you to? You see, we aren't the ones to actually cast the vision for what's next. We actually don't get to choose the seeds that are going to be planted and the fruit that is going to come out of Hillmark Covenant. We get to till the soil. So what am I asking you to do this morning? I'm asking you to just be people of the word to allow your lives to be transformed from the inside out, to allow our identity as a church to be rooted in the word. Covenanters, where is it written? We know that. And I pray for every word that I've said here this morning, as I'm saying it, you know the scripture that supports it because I don't want to preach anything other than the word of God. You just would have been here all day if I would have had a scripture for every light, right? So let me leave you with this scripture. If there's any doubt, what does God want you to do? Who does God want you to be? Hear this word from Matthew 16. I don't have it on the screen. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. (sighs) Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your old soul, your own soul? Church, this is good news. What do you do? We do what scripture says. Daily. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. This is worth celebrating. This is worth pursuing. This is what we're supposed to be all about. You're being invited as we continue through Genesis to reframe your understanding of reality, your understanding of what matters most. Will you trust God? Will you trust His Word? Will we be a people of the word? It's imperative that we do so because God is looking for partners to restore creation. Since we affirm the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testament is the word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. Well, then I leave you with this final word. I'm going to invite the worship team up. Matthew 22, 36 through 39. Teacher, Jesus, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
We are a people of the word. That is who we are supposed to be. And so I pray that we can begin taking a step each day closer and closer to Jesus. This is a lifelong journey and we get to do it together. I get to do it for a season and I love you so much. I long to see Hilmar know this about us. Oh, they love the Lord. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. They may not have those words yet, but they'll know it when they see it. They'll know it because, man, those people, I haven't even stepped foot in their door yet. I just live next door to women, and, man, they love me. Let's pray. Father God, this is your word. This is the invitation. And it's hard. You invite us to rest in you. You invite us to be with you. And you invite us through your word to become more like you. And so help us, Jesus today to choose you help us tomorrow to choose you in Jesus name amen I invite you to stand